started. You are very good to us, Father, and we thank you for the opportunity of looking into your word, of using our mind to understand how to think as Jesus thought in a very right and straight way. He is our example of the word, the word of God, and uh, may we think right uh, and be able to give a good answer for the hope that is in us. Thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our passage from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. That seems not logical and normal for a believer, but many do not. Many people choose someone else as uh, their authority instead of the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And that's what we're doing here. We're learning how to give irrefutable answers. Uh, but do this with gentleness and respect. And that's always important because uh, it's like uh, one... Uh, theologian said uh, that he knew when uh, his opponent showed up for the debate his opponent had lost because presuppositional thinking takes away all the uh, uh, answers away from your opponent but do this with gentleness and respect so we don't want to get fat head uh, we want to humbly uh, share this information keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander okay let's turn to Proverbs start there Proverbs chapter 1 chapter 1 verse 7 and this is uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge if we want to know anything we have to start with God if there is anything in the world there has to be a God there has to be a cause for everything we see around us and uh, with God as our foundation in life, we can build upon that knowledge uh, step by step. It says, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool isn't a stupid person. A fool may be someone with multiple PhDs, may be a professor uh, in a major university, whatnot. The fool is someone who has the ability to understand but doesn't use it. They don't use the common sense logic that, that is given to us. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. I just mentioned in Proverbs chapter 1, uh, verse 20, out in the open wisdom calls aloud she raises her voice in the public square on the top of the wall she cries out at the city gate she makes her speech and wisdom is the ability to apply the word of God uh, to all of life's situations 1st Corinthians and we're going to chapter 1 presuppositional approach to giving an answer for the hope that we have is based on the authority of God's Word that God has said certain things and we don't have to shy away from them that the God is truth uh, he is the way the truth and the life 
He only speaks truth. He can't speak anything false. He doesn't hide the truth, but he reveals the truth. And we shouldn't be ashamed of the truth of God's word. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? You talk about the people who have um, high IQ, who uh, have been in the learning process in their life. Uh, they're empiricists, they're rationalists, and uh, they're well known for their knowledge. And it says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? No philosopher by philosophy ever came up to understand the living God. Human wisdom just can't get there. There has to be revelation, word of God. There has to be the Holy Spirit. And there has to be some common sense steps that a person takes. Um, since the wisdom of, the, of God, in the wisdom of God, uh, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Okay, there's the statement, flat out. No empiricist, no rationalist has come to find out who the living God is and what his dictates are. That has to come through God revealing it to us because that's far beyond us. But God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. That's empiricism. That's like the scientific approach. Greeks look for wisdom. Uh, that's uh, your philosophical approach to life and whatnot. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. All right, let's turn back just one book to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God, verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Notice, it doesn't say who don't know the truth. They know it, they suppress it. And that's the problem of mankind, the suppression of God's truth. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. How is it plain? God has made it plain through that which has been made, as it says, because God has made it plain to them since the creation of the world. God's invisible qualities, His attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. No one goes to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and says, well, he just didn't give me enough knowledge. He just didn't give me enough information. Their mouth will be stopped because it will be very plain. They had plenty of information, but they suppressed it. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became empty, futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. They went into idolatry. They chose man-made gods and concepts. Uh, they changed the immortal glory of the, the immortal God for images made to look like humans. They worshiped humans. Or uh, they worshiped birds. There's, there's something in God's creation 
that men have always admired, birds. They can fly away. They've got the power of flight. We don't. And animals, different animals, bears, tigers, whatnot, and reptiles. Reptiles would include all your uh, dangerous, lizard-like, uh, what we would call dinosaurs and whatnot. And so that was impressive, their strength and power. And so they would worship that. Once you have rejected truth, you will pick a lie. Chapter 2. All right. It says they knew God. Well, in chapter 2 it says they knew what they should do, but they suppressed it. Verse 12 in chapter 2. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who have sinned, all who sin under the law will perish by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, what's it mean by that? They understand. They never said, they never saw it written down, you shall not murder. But they knew it was wrong to murder. And they passed laws against murdering. Do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times defending them. And of course, all this will be revealed on the final day, that everyone had a chance. Um, so, uh, people don't have a Christian world viewpoint or a Bible world view, well then how can they know things and how can they do science and, and different things? Because they were made in the image of God. Every human being is in the image of God. And we have the ability to think uh, like God thinks and to reason. Uh, that doesn't mean we use it to His glory, uh, but we do have that ability and the dictates of right and wrong, the moral law written on our hearts. The things that we know are, are true in life are written on our hearts and we may suppress those things, but they're there. Let's go to uh, Proverbs real quick. Proverbs, <clears throat> just after Psalm. We'll start with the first chapter. No, we already got the first chapter. Let's go to the 30th chapter. Chapter 30. So Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to go down to uh, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. That's interesting. He doesn't say some of the words are flawless. He says every word of God is flawless. There's always people that come around and say, well, it contains God's word, but it's not all God's word. Yes, it is. And it testifies. Concerning itself, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. So pretty strong words. There's the old uh, joke about uh, the guy that broke into this man's house, and uh, the man heard him, and when the man got into his bedroom, he turned on the light and he was holding a gun on him. And the thief said, I don't believe in guns. What does that matter? <laughs> it doesn't matter if he doesn't believe in guns. All the guy has to do is pull the trigger. He'll learn to believe. Uh, as believers, we have to have confidence in God's word. 
God knows what he's doing and has amazingly, amazingly protected his word for so long. And uh, all you have to do is pull the trigger. Just use God's word. It does work. Now, you might have to use logic. and That would be a good thing to do if you can show a person how logically they're not thinking straight. And then you could quote the scripture. You are thinking this. I don't believe that because, but I believe what the Word of God says and that all of us are being given a fair chance. And we suppress, push down in our mind the truth about God. And that's what will condemn us, knowing truth and suppressing it. So I, I like the passage there in Proverbs 30. If Solomon had been politically correct, he wouldn't have written that. Because uh, people don't want to acknowledge that God has written. Um, let's see a couple more passages. Uh, chapter 1 of Genesis. This is always one of um, if complete confidence people can find. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. It's a statement that God made it all. And without God, nothing could have been made. If there's anything in the universe, there had to be a God. Where did it come from? That is unanswerable by science. They say, well, there's a big bang. Where did the stuff come from and what banged it? Okay? Uh, they, they don't want to talk about that, but that's the issue. Where did everything come from? What was the cause of all things? And it starts right off at the very beginning and says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's go over here to chapter 8. Well... Um, I'll, I'll just read uh, in chapter 1 also verse 27 so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them people don't want to read that people want to say well maybe it was male and male well, maybe it's female and female. If homosexuality uh, was a part of God's plan, in one generation there wouldn't be any homosexuality because homosexuals don't reproduce. He created a male and female. That's the standard. And he created them in this passage in his image. We have godlike characteristics. We can make choices. Uh, we realize that we are, and we're different than the chair, and we're different than other animals. I am. Uh, and that's God's name, I am. We also realize that we have the ability to choose, I will. Um, and we can think things through. And we realize there are certain things we ought to do. Ought speaks of morality. Um, I ought, I am, I ought, I will. So that makes us in the image of God. Now, chapter 8 of Genesis there. I just want to touch upon this because it's a good passage to remember. Um, Eight twenty-two. This is what God says, quoting God. First of all, he says, I am um, in the passage before 22. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. This is right after the flood of Noah, they're out. And uh, they're starting to spread out into the world. And uh, verse 22, as long as the earth endures. That's the end of time. For planet earth as long as the earth is here seed time and harvest 
cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So global warming is not going to kill us all. The human race isn't going to die because God said, as long as earth endures, there's going to be the regular routine of planting and harvesting of the seasons that change and whatnot. That's his promise. Now, let's take a look at that. God is on his throne. And he says to mankind, earth is going to endure to the end. And then someone comes along that, uh, I don't know what I call them, the greenie. And they say, the earth is going to be destroyed. Uh, we're going to pollute it into non-existence and we'll all die. Now, we have to, and we have to think about this every time we come across something that's contrary to God's word. God is on his throne. And we have two opinions. One is God's and one is man's. Which would a sensible person choose? The eternal, all-knowing God or people whose opinions change? Drop of a hat. Because with Eve in the garden, God had said, eating this fruit, dying you will die. And Satan had said, you're not going to die. In fact, you're going to be smarter than you ever thought. You're going to be smarter as God. And so she's got two opinions and she says, excuse me God, step off your throne and let me sit here and take these two opinions and I'll judge it. And that's many times what we're uh, told to do is be the eternal judge over things instead of taking the eternal judge's words and clinging to them. Now Jesus always claimed to the word of God. Man shall live by bread alone, but for every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, you do not uh, tempt the Lord your God, but you worship Him. Uh, he's the only one to be worshipped. So he always stuck with the word of God. And when he was talking to the learned theologians of his day he said to them at one point you neither know the word of God or the power of God and that was their problem because they had their own opinions about things and so do people today that just gives us a start on what we've got today okay pass out these papers we'll go over them excuse me um, world view at how we make decisions about things, a network of presuppositions, things that we believe beforehand, untested by natural science. We didn't examine and, and experiment to figure these things out. And in light of which, all experience is interpreted. When you get to a Hindu or a Buddhist, they believe everything is one. This is like me. And the floor is like me, and I am like the chair. Everything is one. And the idea is if you can get back to the oneness of everything, you merge into nirvana and you cease to exist. They would say things such as there's a car outside, and there's not a car outside and would contradict themselves with that. Uh, Jehovah's Witness, they have a worldview, and their worldview is very different than other Christians. Um, 
Christian science has a world view uh, that kind of like Buddhism, it's all, it's all an illusion. Uh, sickness is an illusion. And it's just thinking bad things that make you sick. And uh, if you just don't think those things and push them out of your mind, you'll, you'll always be well and you won't die or anything. But they've all died. So there is a little contradiction there. Um, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, etc. They all have a worldview. Now, here's a statement that's <laughs> we'll have to learn this as we go along. We know that Christian that the Christian worldview must be true because because that's what we're going to talk to people about in their worldview. Why they think the things they do and apart from trying to give them evidences. We can give evidences, but we want to touch upon the world view. But if they change their world view, it'll change all their thinking. We know the Christian worldview must be true because, number one, without it, you can't prove anything is true. Now that's a loaded statement. It's a very true statement. Number two, you could answer that question by saying, Christianity alone provides those things we take for granted. That there really is a floor here. We really are in this room together. The things that we take for granted in all of life are because of the Christian worldview. Christianity, thirdly, Christianity alone provides the prerequisites for knowledge and science. There could not be knowledge or knowing anything or any science without the Christian worldview. And I've mentioned before that only when the Christian worldview became dominant in Europe did science take a foothold. Science never started before the Christian worldview became the dominant worldview. Because the Christian worldview says God is logical and God created and God makes sense and we can study his creation and make sense of it. Nobody else thought that. They thought something else. They thought the gods were arbitrary. The gods would change things. And the uh, Christians uh, would come along and say, now wait a minute, let's do this experiment here. Others would say, it doesn't make any difference. It's gonna change. And they would take baking soda and vinegar and they would put it together and they'd get a reaction. Ah, oh, well. If this is what happens, then I should be able to do the same, have the same situations and mix those two together again and have, to have another reaction. And I should be able to do that if I go on top of a mountain and do that. Or if I go in a submarine and do that. Or if I go in a spaceship and do that. And then it becomes a law. We have to be able to test other people's worldviews. Do they make sense? I mean, you know, just the basics of evolutionary worldview. Where did the bang come from? Where did the stuff that exploded into existence come from? They can't answer that. There is no answer for that. Well, then they don't have a worldview that makes sense with reality because we know we are here. They say only through empiricism can you learn anything. But that statement, only through empiricism can you learn any, any knowledge or anything like that, that's not an empirical statement. You didn't experiment to prove that. You just stated that. It's just a statement. Empiricism rationalism and these are the two main ones Jews look for signs empirical Greeks uh, look for wisdom rationalism but we preach Jesus Christ which is telling a message to people 
that they need to trust Jesus Christ, that this is a true message, which is the main way all of us learn. Okay. Um, when we look for testing other world viewpoints, we have to look for arbitrariness. They're just saying this because they, they're just making a statement, or do they have evidence? We don't want to do stuff uh, that is emotional, and, and just because I say so, no, we need evidence for what we say. And if we don't have evidence, you see, our evidence is very clear. I go to Genesis 1.1 and it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So there is a supernatural above the natural world. And that is the origin. And the Bible tells us that's the origin. Okay, where did your world come from? Where did it all start? There is no answer. The Big Bang is not an answer. But anyway, so if it's just arbitrary, just mere opinion, well, that's not how you uh, find out things out, by just stating opinions. Um, is it inconsistent? Uh, well, let's look at some things here. Uh, we've got a, there are preconditions for intelligibility. Laws of logic. But these are the things you touch upon. Mainly these three, the top three, 90% of the time, you'll be talking about these three things with an unbeliever. Now, there's a lot of people who, um, they don't have any problem with what the Bible says. They just need some information about trust in Jesus Christ. So we're going to take this one because we've seen uniformity of nature and absolute morality. And that's not too hard to understand. The uniformity of nature that our experiences in the past kind of determine what our experiences in the future are going to be. I use the illustration of my wife stubbing her toe very badly. And she wanted to avoid that. Not because she knew what would happen in the future. I mean, if it was just a chaotic universe, how do you know uh, if, you, if it's evolution, how do you know that now, uh, once you've stubbed your toe, you develop the ability to enjoy stubbing your toe. And it becomes a pleasurable experience. You don't know the future. But uniformity of nature, the way we do science experiments, that the past will pretty well tell us what will happen in the future because nature is consistent. Uh, absolute morality. Every time someone says you ought to do this or that's wrong, you're talking about absolute morality. Unbelievers do it all the time. Atheists do this all the time. You can't, uh, you can't tell us uh, what, you, what we ought to do. They're telling me what I ought to do, not tell them what they ought to do. Uh, everybody has absolute morality. But we want to look at this from laws of logic today. Now, <clears throat> I'll pass these papers out. These are just practice sheets, and if you pass them, you can go home now. <laughs> I say stuff like that, so see if you're still awake. Now, we will look at these, and they aren't hard to understand. They're just, it just takes practice, as with anything. And that's why it says in the scripture, but in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. This is part of preparing our own hearts. Let's look at the first page that I passed out. This, this is just some of the logical fallacies. In other words, thinking wrong. Because logic is thinking God's way of thinking. That's what logic is. Thinking like God thinks. He thinks smart and rationally. So, reification. Uh, that's one I've used when you know, I put the, the uh, clam up to my ear and I say, what does this fossil tell me? And I listen intently and I never hear a thing because that fossil can't say anything. But you'll hear people say, the fossils say, no, they don't. That's the fallacy of reification. 
attributing concrete characteristics to something that's abstract. All right, and the, the second one there, equivocation, shifting from one meaning of a word to another within an argument. That you, you're, you're talking about one type of thing or definition, and then in the middle of, of your argument, you switch to a different definition. This is done by evolution all the time. They say, change. And then they say, see, evolution's true. There's change. But what they mean is there's variation within a species. There's all kinds of butterflies. I saw a video of a guy who showed a butterfly in it had, on its wing it had what looked like the letter J. And this guy went and spent 15 years going all over the world to look for butterflies and was able to find uh, decorations on butterflies that looked like the whole alphabet, A, B, C, D, all the way through. And then one, one through 10 on butterfly wings. Is that information? No, it's just decoration on the wings, but it's not information. Um, so there's lots of variety of butterflies, there's lots of variety of beetles. But when you're talking about molecules to man, well, that's a different definition. Pond scum or ooze to aura, that's different than variation, because in here we have four variations. There are eight billion variations of people, okay? But they have that variation, but they are evolving into some other species. There's two definitions. One is operational science. We have to understand operational science is when you experiment and learn things through experimentation. And uh, then there's historical evolution uh, where you're trying to interpret the past and that's why no evolutionist will ever win the Nobel Prize because they can never prove their theory. They can come up with all kinds of ideas and scenarios and I can see this or happen or that happen, but they can't prove it in the lab. Uh, it's operational evolution, operational science that put a man on the moon, that make jet airplanes fly, although not one piece, not one piece of a jet engine can fly. But you put all that stuff together the right way and it flies. Uh, operational science teaches us how to make better toasters or better microwaves. That's operational science. But the fact that we may have 20 different kinds of toasters doesn't mean a toaster is evolving. Okay, that's equivocation. Bifurcation. Claiming there are only two mutually exclusive possibilities, either this or that. Not necessarily so, when there may actually be three or more options. Either the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, fill in the blank, however you want to do it. Well, the Chiefs aren't the only one that could win the Super Bowl this year. There are other options, okay? But uh, bifurcation is saying it's either this or that. Either you believe in. Um, Science, or you're a creationist, or whatever. Uh, well, some are, some are both. <laughs> um, I'll just go over those quickly. We're only going to look at these three today. Uh, they give me question. You're assuming what you're trying to prove. Um, the Bible is God's word because the Bible says it's God's word. That's begging the question. Okay, that's not really the way you approach. It. The Bible by begging the question. Although there are times when you have to beg the question in logic when you talk about ultimate things such as God and whatnot. All right, question begging epithet. Uh, using biased, often emotional language to persuade people rather than using logic. Instead of using the logic approach, you say, Well, that guy's an idiot. You hear these type of question begging. Uh, in political talks when they're talking about their opponent and they're saying what a horrible person this person is and whatnot. That's not logic. Complex question. Attempting to persuade 
by asking a loaded question. Phil, have you stopped beating your wife? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Okay. Ad hominem. Attacking the man is what that means. To the man. Instead of you're directing an argument against the person making the claim rather than the claim itself. Well, yeah, but what would you know? You went to a fear of college than I did, or, or whatever, you know. You might want to say, but you're attacking the person, you're not attacking the issue. Faulty appeal to authority, endorsing a claim simply based on the person making it. Well, Reverend so-and-so says, so, I know Ken Hamlet's one time he was told, uh, the Pope said it's okay to believe in evolution. And Ken Hamlet said, well, the Pope's wrong. <laughs> Straightforward. <laughs> uh, faulty appeal to authority. Is the Pope a biological scientist? No. So why would you appeal to him for an authority? Or for that matter, anybody. In every trial, the lawyer tries to get some authority to say something different than what the prosecution is saying. And you have to determine which one makes more sense. That's faulty appeal to authority. Then the straw man fallacy, misrepresenting an opponent's position and proceeding to refute the misrepresentation rather than what the opponent actually claims. So you make the opponent's position look real weak, and then you attack it, because it's a lot easier to push a straw man over than a real man. So you make it look weak, uh, and there's a lot of that that goes on. Okay, now, here we are with some examples. Put on your thinking cap. We're only going to do reification, equivocation, and bifurcation. Just those three. That's all we'll find on this page. Science is a very powerful tool, so why deny the science of evolution? What might that be? Science is a very powerful tool. Operational science, where you're doing experiments. What experiment can you do to prove evolution? None. It can't be done. So why deny the science of evolution? That's a completely different kind of area of science. That's philosophical science. That's not experimental science. So that would be equivocation. You're, you're switching the meaning of science right there. And you're thinking, okay, science, yeah, they, they experiment, they make cars, they make rockets, you know, they make better widgets and whatnot. Okay, so why deny the science of evolution? Well, science evolution isn't making anything, isn't doing any experiments. It's a completely different kind of science. You're equivocating the two. You're, you're saying that uh, you're shifting from one meaning of the word to the other. It's uh, the, uh, the uh, bad dates. It's uh, definition vague or shifting. It's what that is. Nature found a way. What might? Reification. Reification, yeah. Uh, nature can't find any way. Nature doesn't know where it's at. Nature doesn't have a brain. Nature can't find a way. It's kind of like it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Well, why not? Mother Nature isn't anything. That's reification. Either evolution is true or everything we know about the world is wrong. Bifurcation. Bifurcation. Either or. Well, no. Uh, evolution is a scientific fact. Now, you have to figure out, what do you mean by science? There. Experimental science? Operational science? Theoretical science? Kind of like uh, in uh, physics, uh, quantum science. Nobody's ever going to get a 
They call those rewards, scientific awards. Um, Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. Yeah, that's it. Nobody's ever going to get Nobel Prize for quantum physics. Why? Quantum physics is make believe physics. It's just dream it up, just think it up. It, there's no experiments that go with it. Well, this could happen, or that could happen, and then this could happen. There's no science to it. It's all just make believe. Okay, either evolution is true or everything we know about the world is wrong. That's bifurcation. Evolution is a scientific fact. The evolution of bacteria becoming resistant is well documented. We hear that at times, you know. That is equivocation. make the statement first to all evolution and scientific got the evolution of bacteria and we even about evolution of bacteria you talk about variation within a species or you talk about molecules to a new type of species the bacteria can become resistant and then what happens to it the ones that don't die become resistant, will they multiply more? Uh, we'll have another one coming up about spraying for bugs. But uh, there's still bacteria. That hasn't changed. And they don't become some other species. So that's equivocation, two different concepts of evolution. Life invaded the dry ground. We think that might be able three. Reification, yeah. Life doesn't have an army or tanks or guns. Uh, life, you know, can't take over anything as such. Uh, it's talking about fish waddling up on the ground, and if they waddle enough, they'll form feet uh, and move from there. Uh, life cannot invade anything. Okay, species are constantly evolving. Adapting to their environment. The evolution of the SARS virus, the changes in early uh, frequency of many organisms, and the various breeds of dogs all demonstrate the truth of evolution. How can creationists deny, honestly deny evolution? Two different definitions here. This is equivocation. The SARS virus or any virus can mutate, can change, yeah. In fact, you can spray uh, bacteria or insects and kill the vast majority of them so you have more crop than you have eating up stuff. Um, and what happens? They, those that survive reproduce. And let's say you killed 90% of the bugs when you sprayed them. But there were some that were resistant to that. And they reproduce. And they find that when you have the whole population again, only 10% are still resistant. It always reverts back. Dogs. We know that there's a wide variety of dogs, just as like there are... 8 billion in variety of the species called humans. But they're still humans. They're not evolving into anything. And dogs are dogs. Um, the, um, near Colorado Springs, there's a bug museum. And they do this all the time in these type of museums. They'll show you, <laughs> there's more beetles than any other type of creature in the world. They'll show you all these different kinds of beetles, all these different kinds of butterflies, all these different kinds of uh, ladybugs or whatever, okay? And then they'll say, now that shows us the evolution is true. And what are they saying? They're saying there's all this variety within a species, but they haven't proven that roaches become butterflies or anything else. 
So we have two different kinds of uh, science here. Uh, one is talking about uh, the evolution of variation within a species. The other is talking of molecules to whatever, butterflies or to man or whatever. Follow the evidence where it leads. Reification. Reification. And that's what old uh, Fry, a uh, very famous atheist uh, of the 20th century, uh, he always said, I'm just going to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And ultimately, he says the evidence led him to there has to be a God, is what he said. But, uh, and that really bothered everybody because he was the leading spokesperson for atheists in his writings and different things. They said, well, he must be getting old. You know, <laughs> he must have early stage Alzheimer's or something, you know. He couldn't have meant that, you know. Yeah, he didn't mean that. Uh, but it's a false statement to say follow where the evidence leads. The evidence doesn't lead you anywhere. You take the evidence and determine where you're going to go with it. The science that put men on the moon is the same kind of science we use to study what happened millions of years ago. You don't deny the one, why deny the other? Yeah, it could be, uh, it, it's more equivocation when you're talking to, and it, the key is right, um, the science that put the male on the moon is the same kind of science we, we study evolution. No, it's not. One is operational science, and one is theoretical science, or evolutionary science. It's two different kinds of science, and no evolutionary uh, science uh, will ever get the pole surprise for science because it's all theoretical. There's no experiments. So that'd be equivocation. Natural selection guided the development of this species. What do you think that might be? Have you ever seen natural selection walking around among the animals? No. Shepherding them or guiding them to better food or no. Reification. You're giving characteristics to natural selection that it doesn't deserve. It's just a concept is all it is. We don't deny the Bible, but it's your interpretation we believe to be wrong. That's the W is we. We must always compare our interpretation of the Bible with our interpretation of nature to make sure they match. That's equivocation. You're shifting from one meaning of interpretation uh, to another. You interpret literature differently than you interpret experiments or you interpret theories. Two different. And um, in fact, those that interpret science say the only way you can know anything is through empirical scientific investigation. Which means for them there's no such thing as God, there's no such thing as the soul, there's no such thing as angels, there's no such thing as heaven. See, they've already left out that all of those things that involve. There's no such thing as information. Because information does not have molecules. So that would be equivocation. Science says we must limit explanations to the natural world. Natural world being just, just nature, just the stuff. And that's reification. And the last one there, evolution tells us much about the way the world works. Evolution tells us nothing about the way the world works. It's the scientists who believe in evolution who say, well, this must be how it happened. But evolution says nothing. 
but someone who believes in evolution would say something and make an interpretation. And I would look at the same facts as an evolutionist would, and I'd say, I don't see it that way, I see it a different way. So, that was just a kind of a, a fun experiment. <laughs> and I never have tests. No one ever gets graded or anything. <laughs> Those are things that, and it's just a new way of thinking. When you're thinking at worldviews, one of the ways that you can, that people get stopped in their tracks is when they realize they're being illogical. And being illogical means they need to rethink it because you want them not to just spout out opinions, but you want them to give you facts. And you want them to give facts both ways. should be factual, not just opinion or feeling. Uh, because uh, you come to rational decisions through fact-finding. And that's what uh, logic is. Thinking like God thinks. Thinking rationally. Where are we? That looks like we're done. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us and care for us. We thank you that you give us a sound, rational way of thinking that we can use. Help us to stay on track, to see the emotional appeals that are made and to see the false views and the false thinking so that we can help people find the Savior rationally because He is truth in Jesus' name.